So we're going to have today Sungwon here from UC Berkeley. He's going to talk to us about phase transitions and the dynamics of quantum information. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'll talk about the phase transition in the dynamics of quantum information. But before jumping into uh, this topic directly, let me try to place this work in, the, in a broad context. About 40 years ago, there was the first conference on the physics of computation held at MIT. Uh, and these are the pictures of the attendees. And the keynote speech, uh, speak of the conference was done by uh, Richard Feynman. And he suggested a very interesting idea that can be summarized by the following phrase. If you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. And this is the idea that now we refer to uh, as quantum simulation. And this idea of using and harnessing quantum devices has expanded to a uh, much broad uh, scope now. We not only talk about simulating strongly interacting quantum systems at extremely high energy scale or many particles at low temperature, we also talk about performing some computations using quantum devices or designing a new type of sensors whose sensitivity is beyond our current technology. And we are talking about also using these quantum mechanical principles to design a new uh, security protocols and many more. Not only these applications, we have developed uh, theoretical insights behind them. The key word is entanglement, of course. Uh, the quantum error correction, more specifically, describes how to protect desired quantum entanglement or tensor network description that allows you to describe the structure of the entanglement or information scrambling that describes the generic behavior of entanglement structure in a complex systems. And those theoretical developments also has provided a new insight to the important problems, important open problems in other basic science. For example, the quantum gravity is the most a uh, popular topic, I would say. Uh, it proposed a quant black hole information uh, paradox. Also in condensed matter, a certain phase of correlated phase of matter can be classified by their entanglement structure. All, all, also in the basic statistical mechanics, uh, quantum entanglement plays an essential role explaining the generation of entropy. Um, so with this in mind, I think now, the, now the, this field, the quantum information science, is emerging as a new frontier of physics that's characterized by high entanglement and the complexity. And it's facing both basic science and new technology providing the common language called quantum information science. But personally, there's another reason that I'm extremely intrigued by this field, which is the development of the experimental uh, apparatus. Uh, many experimental platforms, such as solid state spins, ultra cold atoms, polar molecules, trapped ions, superconducting qubits, we have started uh, generating the data that's otherwise not accessible using these controllable quantum devices for the scale that's beyond the reach of our classical simulability. In this experiment, it's providing the data so that we can not only confirm the theoretical predictions, oftentimes they also present a new discovery that was not expected. At the same time, uh, those new knowledge in theory has been fed back to the experiment by the form of new theoretical uh, proposal for the experiment or the theory models. And the cycle between the theory and experiment is accelerating ever, uh, producing a new uh, field. So my new diagram looks like this, where the new frontier of physics, the quantum information science, is interfacing basic science such as high energy and condensed matter, as well as new technology, and they are rooted on the rapid cycle between theory and experiment. Um, and my research in the past and current, and probably in the future, are basically the links on those diagrams. In this field, I think we have three important uh, categories of problems that we have to address. The first one is, using these new languages, can we provide fresh insight to the important problems in other fields? Uh, and then information paradox or the exotic phase of matter belongs to these kind of categories. A second problem is now that we are talking about the rule regimes, can we think about uh, unexpected phenomena or new, fundamentally new type of phenomena that only exist in this new type of physics? And finally, uh, it would be very nice if you can design an applications based on this new emerging physics. What I'm going to present for the rest of the talk is mainly about a recent development about the second category, the phase transition that happens in the regime of high entanglement and the complexity. 
And towards the end, I'll very briefly also mention uh, uh, some of my perspectives on the other directions of quantum simulations or designing algorithms or sensing done by existing uh, experimental platforms. So with long introduction, this is the outline of my talk. I'll talk about mostly about new physics that's recently discovered, namely a phase transition that uh, in, in the dynamics of quantum information happens in, uh, in noisy system. As a toy model, we'll talk about a random unitary circuit that's interspersed by projective measurement. And I'll talk about this phase transition in two different languages. The one language is quantum information theory. And the second language is using statistical mechanics models and show that this phase transition can be understood from the perspective of ordering transition in the stem, classical stem bank model. And then we'll move on to the future uh, uh, research direction. Um, uh, the one is a generalization or the straightforward generalization of our uh, research work. But also independently, I'll talk about a new type of new way of designing uh, algorithms. For example, how to, um, how to design an algorithm inspired by the renormalization group flow and error corrections uh, for the near-term devices. And I'll also make some comments on the quantum simulations and sensing in connection to the, what's done in the recent experiment. So any questions so far? OK, let's get started. <clears throat> the phase transition that we'll talk about today uh, originates, I think, at least about 20 years. Um, the Dorit Aronov, who was a quantum information, very prone, uh, the frontiers at the quantum information theorist, uh, studied a similar problem or related problem from a different motivation. She was interested in originally when a macroscopic quantum system behaves a classically. And then her answer to this uh, question was based on the, the uh, by that time, the recently developed concept of fault tolerant quantum computations. She was saying, um, if you consider the fault tolerant quantum computation, then this transition from quantum to classical might not be a smooth crossover, but rather a sharp phase transition. And the idea is simple. If it's fault tolerant, small noise can be tolerated so that you can still perform quantum computation. So you behave essentially at the, as a quantum mechanical object at the larger scale. However, if the, no, if the system is too noisy, so that all the quantum circuits are completely fragmented, there's no hope that you can do the quantum computations. And she provided a bound that there must be a transition uh, probability <coughs> that the fault tolerant threshold at that time, which is 10 to the negative 7, and, and then one half, which is a case where the, all the quantum circuits are fragmented and disconnected by the percolation argument. Recently, this problem has been resurfaced by these two papers, um, where, uh, where they pointed out that this phase transition is maybe more generic behavior rather than it only happens in the fine-tuned uh, quantum circuit for the uh, phase transitions. So they considered the generic quantum dynamics modeled by random unitary circuit. So let's go very slow. Uh, for concreteness, we talk about 1D array of qubits. And this 1D array of qubits are undergoing the, the time evolution uh, enumerated by discrete time. And each time unit, you involve the nearest neighbor gauge applied to like in this layer, layered fashion. Uh, each gate set is randomly chosen from the space of the unitary in a uniform way. And they are all independently distributed. So the time is counted a uh, discrete array. So these circuits are obviously unitary, uh, it's a uni so it resolves the unitarity. At the same time, uh, it has a locality embedded inside. And there's no other feature other than those two. Therefore, in some sense, this circuit represents the most generic quantum evolution that's unitary and has a locality. But on top of that unitary evolutions, those people considered having projective random measurement. So in this case, every time step for every each qubit independently, we flip a coin and then with the probability p, we decide whether to perform projective measurement or not. In case you do not measure anything, just you let it evolve in a coherent way. Um, in case you decide to measure, you projectively measure it to the say up and down basis and the outcome is drawn by probability distribution of the wave function, determined by the wave functions and then we, uh, we normalize the wave functions. Suppose we perform this projective measurement repeatedly and accumulate all the measurement outcomes. So one way to consider the, the physical mechanism of this projective measurement is, OK, you model it as if it's a, defa uh, it's a decoherence. Uh, in, one, uh, that's naively true. However, it is, like, strictly speaking, slightly different. Because in the actual quantum system, whenever the noise happens, 
Experimentalists do not know whether the noise had happened or not. But in this case, we are assuming that we know what, uh, whether this projection ha happened or not. And if it happened, we also know the measurement outcome. Therefore, it's a decoherence, but the information content we assume is maximized. Therefore, we are considering the situation where the, the, the observer myself knows everything that could have been known from a classical perspective. Um, the only randomness or the noisiness of this measurement arises from the fact that there's no control over whether to perform measurement or not, but it's a stochastic process and the, uh, it's a dephasing process. Yes? So you're measuring always in the same basis, but it probably wouldn't make any difference, right? It doesn't make any difference because of random unitary. Yeah. Have we considered the long time evolution for the large system sizes? After a certain time, the many body wave function depends on the measurement history as well as a set of gates you have chosen. And then we consider the entanglement entropy between the two parts of the system, say A and B, the bipartition, for this uh, pure state. Um, namely, we calculate the reduced sensor matrix and calculate the von Neumann entropy. And average this quantity over all possible measure, me measurement outcome you could have gotten, as well as all possible choices of the unitary gauge, EU. And then plot this quantity as a function of time and study its dynamics, the typical behavior of average in this noisy circuit. In these people, they argued by numerical simulation and some analytical arguments that there exists a phase transition. So for a certain P, less than the classical critical point PC, the entanglement grows indefinitely until it's saturated by the volume law, the, uh, the, some saturation value proportional to the volume of the subsystem you consider. But if P is larger than PC, the entanglement cannot grow, but saturate to the small value that's independent of the volume and actually follows the area law scaling entanglement with any subsystem. What if P is 1? What's 1? If P is equal to 1. Oh, you measure everything. So every time yeah. step, you remain the product state. So you can get an area law. Yeah, it's area law with the trivial coefficient, which is 0. With the trivial co coefficient? Yeah, the, well, the coefficient is zero. So the coefficient depends on P and Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, 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 yes. So actually, like, I should have changed it. This shouldn't be L, but it's something proportional to L. So, yes? Um, but this is all over uh, measurement histories. Is that basically uniform over the bitstreams? No. It, the, the probability distribution for the measurement outcome depends on the set of gauge, and they are correlated because the previous measurement affects the measurement probability distribution for the later <coughs> measurement. <coughs> And then according to those gates, the gates that you've drawn, you then produce the... Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. They are the, the, prob the hard measure for you and the probability distributions are depend on each other. Actually, it depends on one side, of course. The measurement outcome depends on the set of unitary. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, however, Basically, on the same day when this paper got appeared on the archive, there's another paper arguing, no, 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 there could not be a phase transition because of the following argument. And turns out the argument is wrong, but I think they are pointing out very important insight to the problem, which I would like to address for the rest of the talk. So they pointed out, let's try to write down a hydrodynamic equation for the growth of entanglement. Every time step, you change entanglement across a certain cut, due to the unitary gauge, uh, uh, which increases entanglement in general, and the measurement, which disentangles certain degrees of freedom from the network, therefore decreases entanglement. However, the increase of the entanglement is limited by the number of gates that go across of the cut. So it follows the area law scaling for any given subsystem. In 1D, it's just order 1. On the other hand, the decrease of entanglement could be potentially volume law scaling, because we are performing a bold, you know, extensive number of measurement on one side, and those measured degrees of freedoms are completely uh, uh, the decoupled from the rest of the system, now falling into the project, uh, product state. Therefore, if you consider the steady state based on this rate equation model, you never get the volume law phase, but only get the area law phase or potentially log, log corrections. And, and that was a very basic argument of this paper, and that was a puzzle that we have to solve. Turns out, only addressing this problem precisely enough, uh, we can get a lot, a lot of insight on the problem. And this is a toy model that illustrates what's happening. Okay. 
teeth down there. Yeah, I think we should be careful to not put the routine down there, but that's fine, it happens more often than not. <laughs> Just one second. Let's try to find itself. Sorry for that. Okay. Say talking choice. So, I think it's complaining about the lamp. Let's see. So, last time this happened, it was just a matter of like waiting a little bit that I think the projector would be happening. Let's see. Does anyone have questions? I think this is a perfect opportunity to bother our speaker with it. Yeah, so yeah, so the same thing. Yeah, so that's what I started doing. Let's see. Wait two seconds. Questions. Questions. Yes. Questions. Yeah. Just uh, a basic question: How do you normally simulate these one uh, D chains with like random unitary gates? Oh, um, if it's a hard random unitary gate. You can only do very small sizes, like probably 18 or 20. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for these purposes, uh, we only, uh, under certain assumptions, we only need the unitary two design, uh, and then we can rely on the Clifford evolution. So many of the numerical stimulations in our paper or the previous paper is done by Clifford evolution. But, it, but it's not necessarily equal, because, like, because the unitary T design becomes relevant for certain cases. And your setup to state is always secure, right? Because yes. Because it's always being projected. That's right. You can think of it as generating a mixed state if you... If you average... If you average over... Yeah, so if you average over different trajectories, then you get a mixed state. And of course you get a maximally mixed state in the late time, all the time. By different trajectories you mean um, different measurement patterns or different outcomes of those patterns? Both. Okay, even if you fix the measurement pattern and then average over different measurement outcome, still you get a mixed state, of course. And it's going to be maximally mixed state in the long time limit. If you average over different positioning of measurement, of course you also get the measurement, uh, the mixed state. Okay, shall we go on? Okay, so here is a toy model. We consider uh, initially a large number of bell pairs here between left and right, the gamma times n, and n is very large, and gamma is some number from zero to one. And then we have our n scylla uh, that's initially disentangled by one minus gamma times n, so the total n spins on the left, gamma times n spin on the right, and apply random scrambling unitary among those n qubits. And any other unitary doesn't really matter on the right. And then we choose a randomly a certain fraction f of n. I'm going to call those unmeasured qubits as a, measured qubits as b, and uh, watch on the right as c. Before performing projective measurement on b, the entanglement across this cut as a b or is equal to as c equals to gamma times n. Just, uh, just uh, initially show the belt here. The question is, if you measure an extensive number of qubits on the B, whether or not the entanglement after the measurement uh, drops or not. That's the question. But actually, this problem is much easier to solve uh, than before. The answer is not always. Uh, if, uh, under certain conditions, especially when the size of B and C combined is less than the total system size. The subsystem B and C is maximally entangled with the, the remaining part A. And that's in high energy called the page, uh, page theorem. Uh, in quantum information, it's called the decoupling theorem. And also in the, <clears throat> in the condensed matter or statistical mechanics, it's, called, it's basically the same idea as ETH at the infinite temperature. Whenever this happens, the reduced sensory matrix for the row BC factorizes into two maximally mixed states. That means mutual information is zero. They don't know each other uh, about anything. And any action what you do on B does not affect the reduced sensitivity of C. 
Therefore, the entanglement entropy between uh, A and C, or A, B, and C, does not change at all. Or it, the entanglement reduction is exponentially small in N. So what I've said here can be uh, exactly and mathematically formulated uh, by using the theorem that can, uh, that can be found in the, in the mathematics text, the, just the textbook. So extensive measurement uh, sometimes does not reduce entanglement. Indeed, this is a quantum mechanical phenomena. If you replace the scrambling unitary by the classical permutation of different qubits, with a certain probability, we hit the right belt pair, and then once it's projected, we decrease entanglement. So this protection is truly a uh, quantum mechanical phenomena. So the conclusion that we draw from this exercise is that by scrambling the information, we can robustly protect the information or the correlation being revealed by projective measurement. So this is basic idea of the natural error correction. We can build this connection to the, the natural error correction to the next level more seriously. The same diagram, but I renamed U with the U encoding. And I changed the question. What is the maximum amount of number of bits, coherent quantum bits, that can be transmitted from C to A in these settings? And this question is a, defini a defining statement of so-called quantum channel capacity. And then quantum channel capacity is quantified by so-called coherent information, IC. I'm not going to define the definition of it, but it's a, it's a quantity that's proposed by uh, Seth Lloyd uh, and then proved by Peter Shore. Optimize over all possible encoding scheme. And turns out the coherent information in this case with a few lines of uh, calculations, uh, we can show that this coherent information is exactly the entanglement entropy between A and C after measurement averaged over the measurement outcome probability. And these are exactly equal to one another. So think about uh, C actually facing down. And then C is allowed to send uh, some bell pairs. And then, uh, OK, you have those. So we're not already entangled? I mean, this is not the configuration? I thought you meant maybe teleportation or something. But is this, is this not the starting configuration? Uh, it also works like that. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same protocol anyways, for example. Suppose C initially start with the gamma and bell pairs. And there's an unknown quantum state psi, uh, a certain number of bits, yeah. say a, a n bits, a k bits that the C wants to teleport to A. But the problem is, if you have enough bell pairs, of course, you can always transfer it by just you know, teleportation. Yeah. But we know that a certain fraction of the bell pairs will be projectively measured yeah. on B. Yeah. So knowing that it will be, uh, you know, a certain fraction it will be measured, the, the A and C jointly decides to encode the information such a way that by applying this unitary, they encode the information involving Ancilla such a way that even after a certain fraction is projectively measured, they do the decoding scheme from the remaining part so that you can teleport this one bit of information. Can I just think of that as a sequence of first teleporting, then before A reads out the information, I have some, some noise or I, 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 I lose some of my qubits, uh, and then the question is just whether, I, whether the U encoding has protected them against that noise or not. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. You so can think I, of that. I can somehow remove this whole transmission thing from that. Oh yeah, that's right. You, you can. I mean, what you, what you said is actually this diagram just cut out here. Right. That's absolutely true. I wanted to use the same diagram from previous slide, but uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, um, and then this coherent information uh, is exactly the average entanglement entropy after the measurement. And furthermore, we can show with a few lines that this is maximized when you choose this U encoding to be the hot scrambling uh, random unitary. From this perspective, we now know that the, the quantum channel capacity is exactly equal to the average entanglement entropy uh, with respect to the, the measurement when you choose the scrambling unitary. Therefore, uh, our phase transition is exactly the, the phase transition and the quantum channel capacity. And this idea can be, so so far I only talked about non-local unitary scrambling the whole qubit, but let's go back to our original model by modifying our original model in the following way. Rather than considering an uh, individual qubit array, we consider the, uh, each, or each side we have an m different qubits and qubit cluster. And also, in, instead of the two qubit gates, we consider like a smaller quantum circuit of depth d. In this, uh, and the measurement, it's not probabilistic, but we always measure a certain fraction p among the, these clusters. 
In this way, we can independently tune the degree of information scrambling tuned by the depth of the circuit and the measurement by the fraction of the qubit. And we work in the regime where m is very large, so it's basically large n limit. In this case, each box, blue box, represents encoding the information. This is going really fast, I'm sorry. But the rule is that p denotes the fraction within each group of m qubits that's measured, yes. or it denotes an R. That's right. Certain fraction within m is measured here, and of course that's true for everywhere. So in every site, I measure a fraction m of qubits. That's right. On that site, on that group. That's right. That's right. Any other question? Yeah. Is P the same for all the, the wires? Or yeah, yeah, we assume it's the same for all the wires, yeah. All, all the sites. Yeah, in this case. I'm so sorry, but can you just uh, say again why are we considering this uh, generalization? Uh, because uh, we want to go back to the phase transition in our toy, uh, initial model. That the distinction between this toy model to the, our model is a locality. Here we are assuming n qubits are scrambling in a global way instantaneously, one, one step. But our local model has a locality embedded here. So I'm bringing the locality back. So uh, D is uh, the number of times you can do two local. Yes, within, within each local. box. Yeah, each, within each box. Yeah, it's a proxy to the degree of scrambling. Yeah. Um, and if you do that, each blue box, you can think of it as a, a encoding of information. Uh, according to decoupling theorem and page theorem, we can uh, protect a certain amount of information, say alpha times m, and alpha is a certain fraction. And whenever this alpha is not equal to zero, this whole entire system will develop the entanglement, like long range entanglement, that's supported on this logical bit of information. So the phase transition between the volume law scaling versus the area law scaling entanglement is essentially the scaling uh, phase transition in this alpha, the quantum channel capacity per site, <coughs> per qubit. Indeed, if you do the Clifford numerical simulation for this uh, model, we indeed see that, uh, that the volume law phase gets expanded whenever d in, uh, uh, over m is expanded, and it approaches almost equal to 1. So we verify our theory. The so take-home message here is the entanglement phase transition is essentially the transition in the quantum channel capacity per qubit. And the mechanism is a competition between information scrambling and the measurement that behaves as an error correcting code and an error. And then I'll now describe the same phase transition uh, using a different languages, using the classical statistical mechanics model. What we are going to do, we'll map this uh, one plus one dimensional quantum circuit into the two dimensional classical stemming model. Uh, but this mapping has been done in the past for the unitary circuit, but we are generalizing the technique so that we can involve the, incorporate the measurement, the projected measurement into it. Uh, we will show that this phase transition can be understood as a, uh, qualitatively as a ordering transition in the spin model. So that we will try to understand the universality class of the phase transition under certain conditions. And also, by doing uh, uh, exercise, we will learn different insights about the, how to measure or identify the phase transitions, so-called Fisher information. So can you go back one, once, right? Yeah. Oh, well, this is, uh, yeah, final, yeah. yeah. Um, so what was P? So this P is a critical probability. So when P is larger than PC, it's area law. It's how strongly you're measuring. Yeah, how, yeah, how strong the number of fraction, the fraction of qubits you measure. Uh, okay, yeah, I just yeah. to, uh, Can I ask you a slightly simpler setup just to make sure if, I have, if that gives me the right intuition? Yeah. Uh, so I could have, I don't know, 10 qubits, and then I scramble them into 1,000 qubits uh, in a good way. Yeah. Uh, and then I measure 300 of the 1,000 qubits. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, I'm trying to see how this is iterated. So, um, so, so somehow, when you good, um, I'm sorry. When you go from one of these sites with with uh, m qubits mm -hmm. uh, to the next step in time, yeah. Um, 
you you you, me you scramble and you measure. Yeah. And you measure some fraction of them. Yeah. I see. And then um, I think then you just, so I should always think of the thumb, but then I just scramble again. Yeah. And, and the point is that so long as I only measure some fraction, whatever, thirty percent of them. Yeah. I'm not going to lose their information. That's right. And then what this is saying is that when I have some yeah, it's some structure. Yeah, yeah. Clusters, yeah, yeah. Uh, that doesn't change. I mean, that doesn't change any logical behavior. Yeah. Exactly. And so why isn't the why isn't that the number one half appearing here somewhere, which is sort of the one that, is, that matters for a page? I, I guess you have a lot of parameters. I'm probably losing track of. Oh, the the one half where yeah. it comes from. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the one way to ex explain this one half, and that's the safe regime. Um, if you measure actually more than one half. Actually, we can still prove that the entanglement is pr protected for, for this model. So your intuition is right. So for this particular model, even if you measure more than one half, we can show that the information is protected. But the argument is a little more involved. No, I think the question is why it's not always one half. <clears throat> yeah, I'm actually very surprised that you're telling me you can measure more than one half. So it was not right. How can you measure more than one half and yeah. still know which was that Yeah, so let's put it this way. Um, um, you have a 10 qubits in, and then you have a, a 90 more qubits. You bring the 90 more in the ancilla, so that's a total like uh, the 100 qubits. And scrambling information, but 10 logical information scrambling the 100. And you measure 90 qubits. You measure the 90 qubits, right? So that. Suppose you have 90 out of the 100. Okay. Okay, you have only 10 qubit rates, right? You're measuring the more than half, yeah. right? And you naively say, hey, actually, this is not good because you are measuring the more than half. So you're destroying a lot of information. Yeah. Um, the, the case is, if you throw away this 90 qubits, and using this 10 qubits, you cannot retrieve information, because 90 is more than half of 100. Yeah. But if you know the measurement outcome from the 90, and you know what this unitary is, you have measurement outcome, the classical bit of information. Yeah. Yeah? And this unitary, uh, and then you know what this unitary is. And then let's assume, of course, everything thermodynamic limit, like 100 was actually 1,000, like every scale up. And then asymptotically, you can recover like 10 qubits. Accurately, even though it's more than half. And that has nothing to do with this whole networking and iteration. It's just a statement about. What yeah, the proving proving this statement is actually a little more involved, but it's as a matter of fact, it's true. The the distinction is I didn't want to bring up how to use this classical bit of information to decode, but the situation is different because you are not throwing away these ninety qubits. But you're actually performing the measurement, and you, you're allowed to utilize those information to decode the information. Is this supposed to be true if I have many copies of the system and I make many such measurements? I'm finding this extremely hard to believe if I get to do it only once. Because the, I mean, it's a statistical measure, it's on average measurement for the how random unitary, of course. But the, yes, in the large and limited, this is true. Yeah. But by the way, we've proved it yesterday, so it's a, it's a new result. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. The, well, the, the, the density yeah. operator for the 90% that you. Oh, okay, sorry, I, yeah. I, I need it. Yeah, I okay. That. And also, like, just, just clarify, I, I, let me give you like, two bit of information. First of all, you're projectively measuring and you gain the classical information, right? So that, that's one thing. And that's different from being able to measure into whatever the basis you want. Right? It's, it's different from having an access to the 90 qubits because they have been dephased and they depolarized and they only give the classical information. So a certain bit of information is not accessible by these 90 qubits. Therefore, it's, even though it's more than half, you cannot say you have a full information about initial 10. Wait, but I thought you were telling me that I can. No, you can recover the, the information from the remaining unmeasured 10 utilizing this classical information. Yeah, so the combination of those two things allows me to... to yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I find that's that right. incredibly surprising. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Just one last question. 
Yes. Uh, the 10 qubits that you pick after the scrambling of the measurement, do they have to be the 10 qubits that the information was initially? It doesn't matter because we are assuming like randomly scrambling unitary within those clusters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, technically, finite depth D. Finite depth D doesn't work. We are talking about like this D very large compared to M. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to how do we understand this uh, mapping to spin model. Um, yes, the key idea is we, we are going to use a replica trick. So just to recap, so so far we've been talking about the von Neumann entanglement entropy between the two parts of the system, averaged over measurement outcome and the unitary gauge. But we'll introduce the new quantity S n, and n is a in, uh, the integer, the larger than n equal to two. Uh, and the property of n, uh, S n is such that uh, first, this quantity will map to the, the, the free energy of the spin model. And also, if you take the analytic continuation of n goes to 1, we make sure this goes back to uh, this von Neumann entropy, averaged over uh, 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 all possible measurement outcome and unitary gate. And this is the exact expression for my Sn. Uh, it looks complicated, but the idea is pretty simple. It's essentially the Rennie n entropy. However, we average in a different way. We have a log mean exponential. We exponentiate it and take the average and then take the logarithms. And when take the mean uh, average, we do not weight by the measurement probability, but probability to the power n. And then this nth moment, we divide by the nth moment. So it's considered the nth moment of log mean exponent of running n entropy. So everything n. Uh, and then we write this part as a numerator ZA, denominator Z0, and we are going to show these are the partition function of the classical spin model. The same spin model, but having the different top boundary conditions. The logarithm of the partition function is a free energy. Therefore, this n, Sn is going to be the free energy difference originating from like different top boundary condition. And that's the overall strategy. The nice thing about this quantity, the Za, is that it's basically the nth moment or polynomial in both probability and the reduced density matrix. So we, let's take n equal 2 case as an example. If you consider a double Hilbert space, you can rewrite this Za as a, now I'm considering the numerator, as a, some, some the linear observable in the double Hilbert space. And now we can rewrite this quantity as a tensor natural representation. So this uh, is the quantity of interest, and we want to average over all possible choice of unitary gates. And the main idea is it more or less look the same as a quantum circuit, except that each unitary is actually have involved for you, bracket, copy one, copy two. Uh, another thing is that the top boundary conditions uh, is governed by the choice of operator. We are talking about row square. So in this case, we swapped the subsystem A, and that governs the top boundary conditions. So if you evaluate this tensor diagram by contracting all the tensors, then we get the desired quantity, and we only need to have evaluate, uh, average over unit trait. Turns out this contraction is computationally very intractable because we haven't done anything. We just you drew the diagrammatic representation. <coughs> the idea is, rather than contracting them, I'm going to perform averaging over all possible choice of unitaries first, and then, ever, uh, and then do the contractions. And the hope is that averaging process will make you computationally easy to handle. And that's what happens. So if you consider these four copies of U and then average over unitary, it can be decomposed into the sum of the four different tensor nitrog diagrams that's disconnected, vertical and horizontal. And we have uh, two different types of tensors, plus tensor and minus tensor. And furthermore, this plus tensor and minus tensor basically describe rewiring of those lines. It's a uh, trivial chronicle delta functions uh, in terms of equations. Or simply, we can rewrite this as uh, some weighted sum of two tensor network diagrams where the sigma and tau uh, is a classical variable running over plus minus one. And you already suspected that uh, uh, these classical variable will eventually become the classical variable in our spin models. The advantage is your tensor network is much more simple and then uh, fractalizes into smaller diagrams. So we do this procedure for every gauge here so that we get the honeycomb lattice uh, like this. And then for each assignment of the classical variables for sigma tau, it's very easy to analyze and compute their weight. We have to sum over all the evaluation of sigma and tau. Uh, we can do that. Uh, 
we first enumerate uh, sum over the half of the degrees of freedom, say tau, and then now we can map to the triangular lattice with the uh, spin model, and then write it down as a Hamiltonian. And indeed, the original quantity ZA we consider is exactly the partition sum of this Hamiltonian, where the Hamiltonian is something that we can evaluate explicitly. And we can show that this Hamiltonian has an Ising symmetry. And also, this triangle that is Ising uh, Hamiltonian is happened to be exactly solvable. And we know the exact critical point. So if you tune the original measurement probability in this model, that translate into tuning the coupling J1 and J2 such a way that when P is very less than 1, uh, it's a low temperature. And P is, approaches to 1, it goes to infinite temperature. And we, can sh we know there is a ferromagnetic to paramagnetic phase change, a finite temperature phase change in 2D Ising model. Okay. We do the same thing for the num uh, denominator. I essentially get the same spin model, but only the top boundary condition is modified. And then again, the, eventually this Sn is a free energy difference originating from the two different top boundary conditions. So this is excess free energy coming from the domain wall excitation at the top. So this is a summary. The P is less than Pc. We have a ferromagnetic phase. And then the domain wall coast is essentially the same as the line, the minimum uh, short line along this domain. So you'll suspect whether this minimum line is the same minimum cut picture in RT formula, for example, or random tensile network. I'm not completely sure about the RT formula, but it is the same thing as a random tensile network, RT, uh, the minimum cut picture, it's the same origin, essentially. Um, and when P is larger than PC, it's a paramagnetic phase. The domain wall does not cost any energy. And these results can be generalized to the arbitrary n uh, for n larger than or equal to 2. Um, but before moving to the generalization, I would like to introduce new quantity that we have learned from this exercise. Now let's just switch the question a bit. We, st we consider two different initial state of the quantum system, psi 0 and psi epsilon, where the psi epsilon is weakly perturbed for the single side with a very weak strength, local perturbation. And we, we collect all the measurement outcome from these uh, randomly chosen positions and calculate, see the difference between the two probability distribution of the classical measurement outcome. And only looking at this classical uh, probability distribution, can you tell whether or not the initial state was psi zero or psi epsilon? So that's what we call as a distinguishability phase transitions. And this distinguishability can be quantified by the KL divergence of the probability distribution, which is a classical version of relative entropy. And if you expand it around epsilon equals to zero, the coefficient is so-called the Fisher information that's very relevant for the metrological perspective. How much can you learn about the initial state from the measurement outcome? But this picture is very different from our original problem in a sense that we do not invoke any system wave functions or measuring entanglement. We only look at the, from the complementary perspective, uh, only using the measurement outcome. Our expectation is when measurement probability is very small, the feature information will be small because we don't learn too much. When P is larger than PC, we learn more, so feature information is large. We can repeat the same game, basically, the rewrite uh, using the replica trick and map to the spin model. And then we can show that uh, the, fig uh, the feature information is equal to uh, 1 minus the boundary magnetization at the bottom when the top boundary condition is pinned to the positive. So the Fisher information is bottom magnetization. So when P is less than PC, the ferromagnetic phase, top boundary is pinned to plus, so we have a large magnetization, so Fisher information is small. But in the paramagnetic phase, uh, you have an up and down random, so this is omnitor of zero, so the Fisher information is maximum. And you have a phase transition. This is exact magnetic phase transition, and then Whenever the measurement probability is less than a certain value, you do not learn certain amount of information. But if the measurement probability is larger than a certain value, you learn everything that you could have learned from the classical measurement outcome, repeated classical measurement outcome. Uh, this is a summary, like uh, with the same spin model, depending on what boundary condition you impose, top and bottom, you evaluate the different information theoretic quantity. OK, the generalization to the n is the same. You use this identity, the unitary t design property, to map to the spin model. Now the Ising variables is replaced by the classical variable that enumerates the element of Sn group, the permutation group. And everything remains the same, except that the final spin model 
does not necessarily have a positive weight all the time. It could have a, it has a sign problem. And exactly solving it, even by numerically, is not necessarily easy. But this problem can be resolved under a certain limit. So far, we consider the qubit, but we could have considered the qubit, where the internal state of the each qubit is replaced by d states, and take a large d limit. It's uh, basically a large n limit. In this limit, this uh, we can show that the phase transition happens where the weights are all positive. And furthermore, this whole classical Hamiltonian reduces to so-called standard n factorial state patch model, whose exact phase transition is known uh, in the literature. So the universality class of the phase transition is known in several different cases. For example, the n equal to arbitrary d, it's an Ising conformal field theory with the, the, the critical point here. Uh, for arbitrary n, when d is, goes to infinity, we have a gen, uh, the n state patch model. It's a first order phase transition. Um, now, if you take the analytic continuation of n goes to 1, when after standing d goes to infinity, the, the POTS model is known to reduce to the percolation problem. Therefore, the critical point in this case is 1 half. But for the generic d equal 2 with the n goes to 1 limit, this is still open question. Our numerical simulation uh, suggests that it's about 0.25. And this is a critical point as a function of, uh, here I should have said d, the internal, uh, the dimension of the state. It, and this is a numerical simulation. It seems to agree reasonably with n equal to results. So if you want to realize this system with the experiment, there are a few challenges that you need to address. The first one is implying naively unitary gauge and performing the interspersed measurement and measuring entanglement entropy and imperfection in large number of repetitions. Most of them can be actually resolved. For example, because we know the important is a scram information scrambling, the random unitary is not really necessary. Second, the interspersed measurement is, as far as I know, has not been implemented in any platform uh, for the control of quantum devices as of now. However, it's fine because instead of measuring, we can bring on Ansela and perform the controlled gate. And then two results are exactly one another. You can postpone the measurement to the end of the circuit. And this is technique is always using, uh, used. So the modified diagram is like this. Uh, and the measuring entanglement entropy sounds crazy, but actually has been experimentally demonstrated already using two different mechanisms. One is many body beam splitter for the bosonic particles, or using so called randomized measurement. It's similar to the quantum state tomography, but probably could be more efficient uh, using the trapped ions. And, our, uh, and more importantly, we talked about feature information that does not require the measurement entanglement entropy. Therefore, we have some benefit from it. Finally, uh, from our spin model, we believe that even if there is a imperfections, uh, I didn't talk about how to incorporate the imperfection too much, but we will believe as long as the depth is uh, not crazy, we can do well. Yeah, question? If you don't have max access to the measurement outcomes and you can only do like not exponentially difficult measurements on the system? Yeah. Is there, what, what's observable? Is there anything? If you do not have a measurement outcome, uh, you cannot trace over the measurement outcome. You still are doing measurements, you just don't look. Yeah, then there does not exist phase transition. So, in local observables? Yeah, or the phase transition is not even well defined. You can think of it in this way. If you map to the spin model, where the measurement outcome is not recorded, you can still do the map to the spin model. In the spin model, it appears as an external magnetic field that breaks the Ising symmetry. So the ordering phase change is not well defined. And the reason, the, the, the resolution is this. The fundamentally, the phase transition here is about the entropy. And entropy is a subjective quantity. Depending on the knowledge, the entropy changes, right? From the moment you miss large fraction of measurement outcome, you're losing the knowledge. And that's the breaking Ising symmetry. So you cannot have a phase transition. So we, I mean, so so that's what I wanted to emphasize. Actually, the phase transition here is fundamentally information theoretic phase transition, not the physical uh, uh, physical phase transition. Knowing the measurement result comes into the Ising symmetry in the set in the fact that I guess you have to when you multiply your system, you look at two systems. You have yeah. to have the two replicas have exactly the same measurement result. That's right. That's right. That's right. If they have different ones. That breaks the Ising symmetry. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, technically, the two copies, the, the, the Ising symmetry is coming from the identity between the two copies, the swap of the two copies. So I don't understand. So suppose magically this leftover right could measure area 
offers this well and long. So I, I do a trajectory and I go look at my measurements. I measure the coefficient to the area long. Yeah. And I keep doing that. But every time you do that, you get a me different measurement outcome in the trajectory. So you're not. Let me use the same unit each time. Yeah, but different measurement outcome, outcome, yeah. Outcome, but I'm not looking at that. That's right. And then I just average over repeating many times the entanglement I get. That's right. Isn't that what you want to compute? In the no. 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 What you want to compute is you fix the unit tree yeah. and perform the measurement outcome. If anything is, is different from the previous run, throw it away, do it again, and then. But, Post select for the same set of measurement outcome and then for those calculate measurements. Oh, yeah, yeah, but if you fix the measurement outcomes, you can't measure the entanglement entropy because you have only one copy of the wave function. I think just imagine, cannot, yeah, but if, uh, imagine I had magically a way If you had a magical way to measure the entanglement entropy from a single instance of the wave function, then yeah. there would be a transition there. Well, I ask you back. Can you do that actually? Yeah, well, yeah that's right. No, can you, yeah, it's not possible. Would, that breaks the unitary That's why I wanted to know the stricter thing, which is that yeah. you could do local measurements, but first I wanted to clarify that yeah, yeah, no. you can magically measure the entanglement, then. That's right. I think, I think then if you could magically measure the entanglement in one instance, then yes. But the problem is because you need many instances, you need to post yeah. section on the same measurement results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but by the way, the, the statement of being able to measure entanglement in one shot is already fundamentally not possible, and it's provable by notion of sample complexity. It's a, it's a, comp it's a computational problem, yeah, it's not possible. Um, <coughs> and based on this, uh, so pr uh, any other question, actually? Um, I do, but I'll wait until we finish. Okay. So based on this consideration, I, the, the, our, the proof of principle experiment can be done by the trapped ion utilizing this long range interaction at high fidelity gauge. And so this is a summary of the, this part. Uh, if we have an entanglement phase transition, which is essentially changing the <coughs> quantum channel capacity. And from a totally complementary perspective, we talked about the change in the fissure informations. And they are related by the scrambling of the measurement uh, error correction. And we could understand this whole framework using the mapping to the spin model. So, the so next we I, I'll talk about a couple of future directions. <clears throat> the first, the direct, the, the direct generalization of quantum, uh, this this research. Uh, on the fundamental physics side, it would be interesting to look at the different geometry um, um, or dimensions or presence of long range interaction, conservation law, or connection to the quantum chaos. Uh, we know that the fissure information that we extracted is actually related to the out of time autocorrelator in the port perturbative region. So. If you're interested, we can talk about that. From practical applications, we should consider uh, the, infect, uh, the effect of the imperfections uh, and then potentially you know, for, feed, the effect of feed forwarding. Uh, we have done the calculation a little bit, and turns out our technique to mapping to the spin model can be used to test the, some of the assumptions that goes into the quantum supremacy test, especially the fact that their circuit is large enough can be tested. And the fact that the, there's the, the, their cost function scales in a way they claim can be tested like quantitatively. In the long term, I would like to understand the flow of quantum information in terms of effective field theory descriptions, or design a noisy resilient circuit based on those, uh, the, the, the ferromagnetic phase transition and the known results, and apply uh, this technique to the black hole information paradox but rather than studying the steady case, I would like to study the dynamical behavior where the scrambling and the, the measurement is competing one another. Uh, another outlook is uh, basically one of the messages that I want to deliver through this talk is it'll be, uh, I, I would like to argue that it's one of the best ways to design a new quantum algorithm is by using the ideas from theoretical physics. To, to illustrate this, I want to like, talk about my, my own other work, but just a couple of slides, so-called the convolutional neural network. It's a particular architecture of a quantum circuit. We have an input here, and apply nearest neighbor gate, shallow depth, perform measurement on a certain qubit, and then repeat the structure in a hierarchical structure. So this is just an architecture, and this architecture is motivated by a convolutional neural network, and also this MERA structure of tensor network. And also, it's, a, it's good because it can be efficiently implemented. So we use this architecture to solve the problem called quantum phase recognition. Suppose you are given an input wave function rho in, and your job is to tell whether this rho in belongs to a particular quantum phase p, say, ferromagnetic phase, 
or like topological phase? And my answer should be yes or no. And this problem is a direct analogy of this image recognition. However, it's quantum because our image is not a cat or dog, it's a quantum many body wave function. We designed an analytic uh, QCNN solution based on the renormalization group flow. So I'll not explain the detail, but only sketch the idea. A given row in, I'll design a quantum circuit that emulates RG flow towards the fixed point of the target phase P. And when I say emulate RG flow, I'm actually meaning performing quantum error corrections. In this language, integrating out UV physics is identifying the local deformation of the wave function or error and then correcting back. And what I mean by stable RG fixed point, the final point, is a quantum state without any error. So perform these error corrections and see whether this input flows to the particular fixed point or not. It goes to the right fixed point, we say it belongs to the phase. It does not, it say it does not belong to the phase. And we, are, we apply this idea to a particular toy model in the one dimensional case. And what you see on the left is a phase diagram for this toy model. And what you see on the right is uh, the phase diagram reproduced by our quantum circuit. And actually, if you plot on top of each other, the, the discrepancy is not visible. And furthermore, we can show that the efficiency of identifying this phase is actually better than the conventional method known in the condensed matter. For example, measuring a string order parameter uh, in terms of so-called sample complexity. So what I wanted to emphasize is that designing a quantum algorithm like in this way, based on the physical principle, would be the very interesting direction to pursue. The second idea is about, uh, the analog is about analog quantum simulation and sensing. So we talked about many different platforms. They all have a pros and cons and the different characteristics. But I would like to say, a certain type of experiment is very naturally connected to a particular experimental platform. So one example is this story about time crystal, uh, uh, initially proposed by Frank Wilczek in 2012. Soon after, it realized that uh, equilibrium physics cannot support the time crystal, but you have to go to out of equilibrium high energy states uh, in order to support so-called discrete time crystals. So the key elements of discrete time crystals are these, like many body systems, strong disorder, and interactions, and periodic drive. Turns out exact same elements are very naturally present in our ensemble of spins that you studied uh, uh, also here at UC Berkeley by Norman Yao. Uh, he's doing the experiment on those systems. So we ended up reporting the very first observation of discrete time crystal in order. And not only this, this DTC order, any quantum simulation that relies on this many body system interaction disorder and periodic drive, we could do it. For example, the slow spin dynamics predicted by Anderson about 50 years ago, or probing the thermalizations. More recently, uh, we designed how to manipulate the dynamics of the system, either turn on and off their interaction uh, by will. And we use those techniques to build a quantum sensor out of it and achieve the sensitivity that's beyond the existing technology. Uh, and uh, it's in the review process now. Uh, another example is this so-called atom array set up. It's a, it's a new experimental platforms. The idea is actually very simple. Using the laser, you trap individual atoms in a particular uh, way. And you encode the information 0, 1, or up and down by whether the electron is orbiting on a ground state or the highly excited state with the large orbital size, so-called the Rieberg state. Uh, we have done, uh, my colleagues and I have done multiple experiments, like Kibble Dreck, uh, or like even discovered a new uh, phenomena, so-called, now we call it as a quantum anybody scar. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about is the, what I'm going to talk about like, next. So in this system, we control the interaction between atoms simply by tuning the distance between the nearby atoms. And also, we can apply the laser to make an excitation or de-excitation of these up and down configurations. So if you tune the distance close enough, what happens is two simultaneous up excitation, two, the ripple excitation is energetically too high, so you cannot make an excitation while the three, ener the three states are reasonably OK energetically. And we can all turn on the laser to put some of the dynamics, some, some fluctuation, quantum fluctuation on it. And we operated a multiple experiment on this regime. And so-called the Rippog Hamiltonian of those system turns out is exactly equal to a particular lattice gauge theory defined in 1D lattice, so-called the quantum link model for the, where the, the gauge field is, is represented by the spin one half particles and no approximation, just equal to one another. In this case, 
Uh, this constraint, the particular non-trivial constraint, behaves as a Gauss's law. The fact that the total charge has to zero, uh, the zero, zero charge sector of the Gauss's law. And say up down up down configuration goes to the empty state with the electric field in uniform. Uh, another down up down up configuration goes to another bare vacuum with the opposite direction of electric field. If you have any domain walls, depending on whether it's even side or all sides, you have a one particle, quasi particle, uh, one particle either matter or antimatter uh, that changes the field configurations. So what I'm trying to say is. Well, like I'm not saying we have to implement or like study this particular model. But I wanted to emphasize that this gap between the, the, the experimental platform and the theory we are interested in is actually smaller than we, we believe. So with that, this is my summary slide. Um, and thank you for your attention.